it's important to, to say that not just women are victims of intimate partner violence, but men are and people of all genders can be, which I think is another factor in underreporting. I think in general, folks who are experiencing domestic violence are reluctant to report abuse for many different reasons. They could be embarrassed, ashamed, it could compromise their safety if they seek help, and they may not know where to go. I think that one of the main contributors is this silent culture. Um, this idea that this is family business, we don't talk about it outside of this house. It certainly reduces the help-seeking behavior because there's already a stigma surrounding help-seeking and the black woman who's supposed to be superwoman, right? She's supposed to take care of everything. She's supposed to work, take care of the children, take care of home, and be okay and not show weakness. Uh, so it certainly um, impacts help-seeking when there is this culture of that's your private business, that's behind closed doors, you should be taking care of it that way. I think in New York City, we're very lucky that we have resources available for people who need help with intimate partner violence, um, whether or not they're, they're men, women, LGBT, trans individuals. There's many different organizations that have counseling, safety planning, legal services, um, with special training on working with diverse populations. I would say over the last 15 years, there have been significant advances in New York State. Overall, even the courts are um, evolving to address uh, domestic violence in a way that is more client-centered, in a way that is more trauma-informed. So specifically, in New York State, they developed integrated domestic violence courts, which have a model of one family, one judge. And one judge would then be responsible for all cases that relate to domestic violence. So prior to this change, domestic violence victims would have to travel from multiple courts, which were located in, in different locations, uh, in order to address criminal court cases, order protections, custody, visitation, and divorces. Well, New York City um, has, as a protected class, um, domestic violence and, and survivors of sexual assault and stalking. So you cannot be discriminated against in housing or employment, but today is actually a really special day. Um, Governor Cuomo just signed into law the Women's Equality Agenda and the bills that were associated with that, so just a few hours ago. And there's expansions um, for survivors of domestic violence now statewide. It could be difficult to leave any abusive relationship, but when there's financial concerns or children, um, housing in New York City is not cheap. Um, it's very difficult to just leave an apartment and go find an, an, another apartment very quickly. Um, if folks are unable to stay with friends, family members, or they don't have the resources to go seek other housing, there is the, the domestic violence shelter system here in the city, which is very well organized. Um, I think it's um, not a perfect solution, but I, I think people are surprised at what resources are available and um, it, it could lead to permanent housing. Urban Resource Institute has extensive experience working with children. Our largest client population are children. Uh, we have served uh, about a thousand individuals, including kids, each year in our shelters. The impact is, is just so, so wide and far-reaching, um, and it depends a lot on the intensity of the abuse that's happening, the length of exposure, um, the age of the child. For younger children, certainly they're the most vulnerable because they're not able to seek help on their own and oftentimes they try to intervene in physical altercations and may become harmed as a result of that. Um, certainly it ranges from emotional health issues where children feel fearful, they're anxious, they feel isolated, not only by the batterer but also the victim because they're not able to form those emotional attachments, especially as young children. The advancements in legal protections also uh, support the needs of kids. So our clients will come into shelter and typically have a host of legal issues that include defending a visitation petition, possibly seeking child support. Some of our victims of domestic violence and their kids are undocumented immigrant survivors. And we have created a legal education and advocacy program to ensure that as soon as they come into our shelter programs, they're aware of what their rights are. Um, but also somatic symptoms, bedwetting, certainly some regression in younger children, 
um, headaches, stomach aches, it manifests that way as well. Um, and certainly as you get older, other things begin to happen with mental health. So depression, acting out, um, not developing appropriate social skills in school because certainly those attachment relationships in the home get played out in school as well. Children are so resilient. No matter what's happening around them, if they have some protective factor, whether that's a grandparent or a teacher or maybe a pastor, someone in their life who provides some sense of normalcy and safety, they can really pull through just about anything. Um, but what I've seen is that children tend to, depending on their, their temperament and their own personalities, they form attachments with different parties. And so I've worked with families who wear in large sibling groups, some children will, will side with the victim and some will side with the batterer. We also understand the impact of a batterer who's also a parent and a child not having a father as a result of the incident. How can we treat and reincorporate some batterers into the family as well? For people who are concerned about their immigration status or interacting with law enforcement, um, immigrants in particular, there's special immigration relief that is available for survivors who cooperate with law enforcement or who are married to U.S. citizen or permanent resident abusers. There's help available. Um, I think, you know, in, in other countries, legal systems work differently, law enforcement operates differently, and that fear of law enforcement um, is very real for individuals. If we don't trust them to do their job, then we're certainly not going to trust them with our most vulnerable issues. And so I think that really impacts seeking help and safety from law enforcement as well. People who come to the U.S. and um, with hopes and dreams of working and building a family, um, when they unfortunately become victims of intimate partner violence, it could be devastating and knowing how to access resources and help when English is not your first language or you're not speaking English at all, where do you go for assistance? How do you reach out? Um, how do you find out information within your community? Um, the Family Justice Centers are a great resource, but people are often concerned about coming to the attention of immigration or law enforcement. Um, that may actually be part of this cycle of abuse where the abuser is using immigration privilege and their status to further abuse and subject their partner to violence. We also have seen some changes in laws and policies that relate to extension of time for orders of protection. We've seen uh, expansions of protections for individuals who are concerned about confidentiality, individuals who are concerned about being discriminated against uh, if they're in the workplace and they're victims of domestic violence. And interestingly, New York State is one of few states that allow pets to be included on order of protections. And that's important for a lot of survivors of domestic violence who own pets. When we looked at the research, up to about 48% of domestic violence victims would not leave a dangerous situation because they would not leave their pet behind. Providing services to the entire family, including the pet, was an initiative that we knew we needed to embrace a number of partners. When we started thinking about the program, we reached out to a number of animal welfare experts, including the ASPCA and the Mayor's Alliance for New York City Animals. So Perina heard about what we were doing and wanted to support the initiative. And through their funding uh, and support, we were able to develop this Perina Play Haven for our families. They also recognized the need for financial support for our families. And so they donated extensive food items, supplies, and materials to make sure that the initiative would, would be successful.